Flip in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. For some time now, we in Sunday school have been uh, having a series of messages dealing with the person, the person and work of Christ, pointing out the ways in which the scripture described Christ as being our remnant, our shield, our sun, our door, the door. All of these images that we have, that give, the scriptures give us, and showing how that, that fleshes out into his work and ministry. Uh, but we're going to take a break from that series this morning and just deal with a separate topic, a topic. And that topic is having to do with his power to save. So we're not too far removed because our series have been the person and work of Christ. So we're dealing with the work of Christ today uh, concerning salvation, concerning his power to save. So if you look with me at Hebrews 7.25, we read, hence also he, that is Christ, is able to save forever. Emphasis on the word forever. Those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The King James translates the word forever, the Greek word that's translated there, with the words the uttermost, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Many books have been written. God has revealed his creation in his word. There are great doctrines of truth to be learned from creation. The green earth, the flowers, the stars, the universe, lessons to be learned from storms, wind, lightning, and all of these speak as God would have them to. And if our ears are open, we may hear the voice of God in nature itself, speaking of his power, his wisdom. There's another book that's been written. That's the book of providence. Much to be learned observing the providences of God. The providences of God as they unfold in the scripture. The providences of God as they unfold in history. The providences of God as they unfold in your life. Day by day week by week. Much to be learned. But there's only one book that God has written which tells us about his salvation. And it's this one. It's the Bible. It's God's word. Teaching men that they are lost. Teaching men how they can be saved. Teaching men how to be just, how God can be just, and yet the justifier of the ungodly. It is only in the scriptures that we have the word of God unfolded to us. How very crucial it is that men have the word of God. To read it, 
so that God can speak to them through that word. That means that it is absolutely mandatory that those who have the responsibility of ministering God's word preach the word. Preach the word with accuracy. Plead with men to respond to that word. The free offer of the gospel. Well, let's look at our text this morning. First of all, who they are that will be saved. Who are they? According to our text, them that come unto God by Jesus Christ. That's who will be saved. In the second place, I'm just giving you our headings of our lesson, we're told the extent of the Savior's ability to save. To what extent can he save? Is he able to save? Will he save? Well, it's to the uttermost. That's all inclusive of whatever salvation needs to be done in a person's life. He can do it and will do it. Then in the third place, we have the reason given as to why he is able to save. And it's due to the fact that he ever lives to make intercession for them. That's the reason given in our text. Of course, we know the reason it involves his life, his holy life, his vicarious death, his resurrection. All of that, of course, is basic to his being able to save. But our text bases his ability to save to the uttermost on the fact that he lives to make intercession. Well, as far as we can this morning, I'm not sure exactly how far we will be able to get, but let's look at these three points. Our text says, hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Christ made a very similar statement concerning himself. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me shall come to me. No exception. The little word all means all. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Our Lord offered an indiscriminate invitation. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My load is light. Come to me. Who does that include? All ranks of life. All kinds of men, women, and children. All classes of people. Every nation, every tribe. Anyone all are invited to come. In our text, it is very clear, they come on to God. But I want to make it very clear. This coming to God 
is not some outward religious act. That is not what is meant. It is not coming to church. It is not participating in some religious activity. It is not coming to the ordinance of baptism or of the Lord's table. It is not the act of praying. There are many people who can pray right and eloquently. And who do so? Those who have learned a form of prayer by heart, perhaps use extemporary thoughts in expressing their prayers. There are those who can pray eloquently without coming to God. In fact, they can pray eloquently while they may be departing from God in their own life. Coming to God is not keeping the Sabbath. It is as much possible to break the Sabbath in church as it is to break the Sabbath by being engaged in worldly pursuits. Coming to God is not what men perhaps think it is. We must come to him with entire dedication of ourselves, giving up all we are and all we ever hope to be, to be fully devoted to him and whatever demands he makes upon us in his word. It means having him be master and Lord over our life. It means not having two masters, just one. And that's the Lord. If a man comes to God, he must leave something. He must leave his sins. He must leave his own self-righteousness. He must leave both his bad works and his so-called good works and come to God, leaving them entirely. I like those words found in 1 Thessalonians, which we studied not so long back where we read, For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God, that's coming to him, from idols to serve a living and true God. That's the very essence of what it means to come to God. But there are some other issues that's involved. Look at the words in our text. Those who draw near to God through him. The old saying is all roads lead to Rome and people assume that all roads lead to God. Not so, just one. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Those who come to God must come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Sad to say, isn't it? People have imagined that there's all what Many, way, many ways of coming to God, to God. Some people think that the way to God is through nature. And 
they become almost nature worshipers. Others think that they can come by somehow connecting with what they call a higher being. Some by transcendental meditation. But the Bible clearly teaches that there is only one way to come to God, and that is through Christ. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The Father, God the Father will never ever save a man apart from Christ. There is not one soul in heaven who has not been saved but by Jesus Christ. And if you would be at peace with God, you must come to God through Christ. Now, when people come to God, as set forth in our text, for what purpose do they come? There are those who imagine that they come to God, but we need to examine the reasons why they come. Many are accustomed to um, praying some sort of prayer when they have an emergency, some pressing need. College students perhaps pray that they'll pass a final exam. Businessmen may pray that a good deal will go through. Sailors pray that the ship will not sink in the midst of a raging storm. They are accustomed in times of difficulty to offer up some sort of prayer. What about the lost sinner coming to Christ? What is the purpose? What is the object? If all the world were offered to him, he would not think it worth his acceptance if he could not have Jesus Christ. Take a man that knows that within the next few hours he will be executed. Offer him what you like. And the only thing he is interested in is a pardon. The last minute. All he wants is his life. So it is with a sinner. When he comes to God, he comes for salvation. And he says, in essence, wealth and honor I disdain. Earthly comforts, Lord, are vain. These will never satisfy. Give me Christ, or else I die. And that is the pleading of a heart truly coming to God through Christ. What manner do we come when we come? Well, we come humbly. James says, but he gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Perhaps we're familiar with the words of the hymn that we sing. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Not putting confidence in oneself or one's good works, no, nothing in my hand I bring. 
Surely we might think of the passage in Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your wages for that which does not satisfy? Isn't it wonderful that we can offer the gospel to anyone, regardless of whether they have or don't have any of this world's goods, and they can come to Christ? Now think of the extent, then, of our Lord's ability to save. The uttermost. How could we measure the ability of Christ to save? To what extent can he save? I just recently had surgery. I might very well ask the question, to what extent will this surgeon's skill reach the heal, the, the, the disease? Can he do it? Does he have the experience? Does he have the ability? Does he have the knowledge? Can he affect the healing? If you're going to have someone do surgery, you want to have the utmost confidence in their ability, right? Not just anybody. Somebody that comes highly recommended. Somebody that has good standing and experience. Our text tells us concerning the salvation of our soul, which involves so much, he is able to save to the uttermost. Think of all that that takes in. From the initial time that a soul comes savingly to Christ, the beginning of the Christian life, the pitfalls, the dangers, the temptations, he's able to save from that. He's able to keep you from that. Able to save us from the enemy. What enemy? The world. Our own remaining sin. Satan. Which implies so much. And yet our Lord is able to save. Through all of that, He is able. If you look up the word uttermost, the definition, you might find these words to the highest, to the highest degree. Now, Christ is able. Now, think of what that involves, may involve, for different individuals. Of course, there are some who have, by common grace, been preserved from a life of sin. Have had the opportunity to be raised in a Christian home in an environment that was conducive to protecting your life from sin that could ruin you. But what about those who have not had that blessing? 
to those who have fallen into deep sin. And it's prevalent in our day. I have the opportunity to minister to men who are in prison. Over the years, I've ministered to a man who, as a teenager, deliberately ran over two individuals and killed them as part of a war between gangs. He was uh, 15 when he did that. And got a life sentence. But God saved him. In prison. Think of the power of God to reach down to that soul and change and transform him by the power of God. God can do that. God can save that man and did save him. I can give you many other examples of some of the depravity of horrible crimes that have been committed by men almost beyond imagination and yet God is able to save to the uttermost. And he is to be praised for that. He's able to save those who have been brought up and encouraged into more or less a life of self-righteousness. I don't need that. I'm as good as anybody. Perhaps better than most. And the door is closed to the gospel because I don't need it. I'm an upright citizen. I'm not a criminal. God can save them too. The self-righteous man to the uttermost. Think of those who have been uh, the victims of, of cults and sold into error of doctrine. It's an amazing thing. I think of I've mentioned Arturo before, but he was one of the men at the migrant camp there in North Carolina. And the priests had their eye on him to get him to go to seminary to become a priest. And God brought him every week to the little Bible study we were having at the migrant camp. And God opened his eyes and his heart to the gospel and saved him. And he went back to his hometown to visit his family and for the purpose of witnessing to the priest, which he did. And the priest kept trying to avoid him and, and not be available and go some other direction. And one day they met face to face providentially and Arturo witnessed to him about the gospel and had a book to give him that was by Spurgeon on all of grace. And he gave the book to the priest. The priest says, I don't want it. And Arturo said, is it because that book teaches that you can be saved by grace and by, by faith alone in Christ alone and by grace? The priest said, yes. God brought Arturo out of that error and darkness. And he's now in the church in Puerto Rico helping Pastor Vader, preaching on occasion. What a marvelous transformation took place 
And you can name any, many, many, many examples of that. What a blessing to know that whoever it is, God can save them and make them into the persons he wants them to be. But I want us to take a brief application here as a word of encouragement to our own hearts and souls. In our own Christian life, there are various battles that we fight. We don't win them all. Someone as well said, we may lose a battle or two here and there, but we will win the war. And that is so true. We will win the war. And God is able to save us from our own remaining sin. And it's a constant battle. It's a spiritual battle. And will be until we are in his presence and able to love him and serve him with an unsinning heart. But our Lord is able to conquer our remaining sin and help us to grow in grace and to mature and to be the people that God wants us to be. We might serve him faithfully and bring many others to a saving knowledge of Christ. Well, I trust that this rather brief lesson has been of some help and encouragement to us in thinking about what God is doing in our own life and what God can do in the lives of others as we have opportunity to talk to them, to witness, to preach, to minister. God is able to save to the uttermost. And we have much to be thankful for even today. Well, we're closing early this morning. I uh, trust that God will bless the remainder of our day as we meet together to worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that's forever settled in heaven. And we do pray your blessing upon it to each of our lives. We pray for those who are not able to be with us today. We pray that you will bless them and keep them and strengthen them by your power. We do pray, Father, that you will bless our balance of time together here this day. We pray and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.